right, I'm in Lowe's and something just happened that I want to make sure that doesn't happen to you guys. I asked for their foundation waterproofing and they brought me to this. project and we're going to be talking about wet basements and four main solutions. Three of them are the ones that we typically will go to first and the last one is more of a last resort type of a solution but you're going to find a lot of companies out there presenting the last resort as your first and best option when in our opinion nothing could be further from the truth and that's the last resort I call interior drain tile because we always like to keep the water out first and foremost before we go to pumping resort to pumping it out and so today we're going to talk about all of those and by the time you're done you're going to have enough ability to enough knowledge to be able to either do it on your own or when somebody comes out to give you an estimate at least you'll know what they're talking about when they're talking to you so yep. what, are, what are we waiting for Tim? we're going to start out with the cheapest possible solution right now all right let's do it Shkadoosh. Okay, so the cheapest possible solution is exterior grading, right? Exterior grading. So you get the call, I'm having water in my basement when it rains. Go out to the house and you look, and first thing I notice is sidewalk. Lower than the grade outside of the sidewalk. It's not doing any good here besides holding your water along your house like a moat when it rains. You see the gutters above. The, the, it's got gutters, but yep. you know, in a, in a heavy rain, gutters don't catch everything. So it has, it's not pitching away from the house. So the very first step that I always say is look up and look down. Those are the very first two things that you wanna do when you're trying to figure out where to start when you have a wet basement. You look up to make sure that you have gutters. If you have gutters, then you wanna make sure they're not plugged up. And then you also wanna make sure that the downspout is routed far enough away from the foundation of a house that it's not working its way back into the house. And I wanna show you that this could be a possibility on this site as well. Let's go check this out. Right here, when we look at this downspout, a lot of times I've seen where this downspout dumps the water from the entire roof load. And then what happens is the water works its way right back into the basement. So it does no good. Does no now if extending the downspout doesn't work because it just gets in the way like it did on this job we did, you can bury a drain tile, but you cannot hard pipe your downspout directly into a buried drain tile. You must have an area of separation to keep it from freezing and, and bursting. Does no good. So you want to make sure that you get that far enough away. And that could be as simple as just putting an extension on your downspout and that could solve some of the problem. But in this case, we're looking at the grades. That's your easiest first step to correcting a water problem in your basement. So when you look at this grade behind me, it looks like it's got a nice taper running away from the house. But actually, it's the reverse. Right now, the grade runs into the house. Looks can be very deceiving. That's why we're gonna be using a laser to make sure that we get all the grades established. If you don't have a laser, you can use a level and an eight foot board to help you achieve your grades. Just simply pitch your board the way you want it, put the level on it, make sure that it's flowing the right way, and you're in business. Yep. Now as we look at this one, Tim, what are you gonna to recommend to these guys? Take this sidewalk out, it's not doing you any good. It's just probably a small, thin sidewalk. Not a big deal, looks old window wells a foot high all you need is just to be able to bring this up you've got up to what six to eight inches from the sill, sill plate. plate so this is a great point that tim brings up right now you can never bury the sill plate of a house and let's talk about what the sill plate of a house is the sill plate is the flat timber i guess that's the right way to put it it's usually should technically be green treated that meets up with the foundation of your house that the rest of the stick framing rests on. So as this concrete goes up, there's a flat board there, and then the stick framing, the vertical walls, go up on top of that. You can never bury the sill plate. All right, you guys, sometimes locating the sill plate is going to be a little difficult. In this room, it's nearly impossible. Just because we have sheetrock there doesn't mean that's where the sill plate is. And I want to show you exactly where the sill plate is and what it looks like. 
So in this case, we're gonna go in this back room and that piece of wood right there is your sill plate. And that's where your framing goes up off from that. You can see where the concrete wall goes up. You got that plate and your framing is above it. Don't bury that plate. And by code, you should be six to eight inches below the sill plate. And this is one of those codes that I highly recommend you actually take a little bit further. I like to keep it at least 12 inches below the sill plate because what happens is if you get this soil too high up on your foundation wall, when the rain hits, it bounces back up like this. And you see a lot of homes have black uh, soil marks on them. And we don't care about the discoloration from dirty water but we do care about the foundation, the, your sill plate, the foundation of your house being wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry, and that's gonna cause you problems, dry rot down the road, right? Yep. So in this situation, we don't need to go that high. If you look at the grade here, um, you bring this up six inches to a foot, taper it out, I, I, I have to say, that's going to solve the problem of water in the basement in this house. And that's usually the simplest solution. Now, when you're pitching it, technically you should have one inch of drop for every eight feet of run. So as you start out, you have a zero point on the foundation wall. As you come out eight feet, you should be one inch lower. That's minimum. If you can be more aggressive than that, all you're doing is making sure that the water sheds a little faster. Right now we've got almost a reverse pitch and a lot of times these homes will have a reverse pitch meaning all of the water instead of shedding away from it goes into it. All right. Right now this is a moat. When it gets wet this water sits here along your foundation and it's going to find its way into your basement. So your simplest easiest fix is grading. Now sometimes you can't grade. You just can't grade or it's not enough of a corrective procedure to make sure that you don't have continuing water problems in your basement and that's when we go to phase two of our correction process and that's a french drain across here just sits right here too yep and so, so if a french drain the way we would install a french drain is we would come in if we had permission from this home and permission from this house we would create a swale and right at the bottom of this swale then we would go 12 inches below that we would install we would wrap that in permeable fabric then we would put three quarter inch sewer rock in that uh, French drain system. Then we would put, put a four inch perforated drain tile in that. Then we put filter fabric on top of that, permeable filter fabric. And then we would cover that so that there's about you know, roughly six to 12 inches of soil on top of that. And that allows the water to permeate through, hit that drain tile and run out. And then Be careful wherever you direct a source of water because if you direct it behind a retaining wall, it can create premature failure or this next job site, this entire hill was actually destroyed because a simple buried drain tile off from a gutter let loose and allowed all of the wa all of this hill to basically wash out. All right, now the third option, which is one of the most invasive options, but sometimes it's necessary, <laughs> is full-fledged foundation water proofing, and that's retrofitting a foundation like we have here, and we excavate all of the soil all the way down to the footing. We expose the footing, so the wall will come down, it will have a footing it will rest on. We expose that footing as well, all the way down to the bottom of that footing. We then take a waterproofing compound. We, we Technically, we clean off the wall. We get it perfectly clean. Then tuck point the wall. So any, any holes or damage to the wall, if it's a CMU, a concrete masonry unit wall, we then got to tuck point it. A lot of times those walls will have chipped blocks, reroll blocks, or problems in them. Then we use a waterproofing compound over the top of that. It can, you can use any local waterproofing compound that you choose. All right, I'm in Lowe's and something just happened that I want to make sure that doesn't happen to you guys. I asked for their foundation waterproofing and they brought me to this, which is foundation waterproofing, but it's only for the inside, it's not for the outside. So although this is the right stuff, you can't use it on the exterior of your foundation. So we gotta go find that. So if somebody tells you that stuff, it's right but wrong. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Dry Seal Premium Rubberized Foundation Coating. That's, I love 
that stuff, the rubberized stuff. I use it all the time. Gray shield. That's just the same thing, just gray, dries gray. This dries black, black, gray, non fibered foundation coating. So you can see that this stuff is actually designed specifically for foundations versus something that is designed. Sometimes they'll try to sell you a roof compound as a foundation coating. I don't prefer to use that. You can use also a waterproofing membrane. We've used that in the past. Those are a prefabricated membrane specifically designed for waterproofing applications. Now I had to go to three different stores to find this. I started at Home Depot, I then went to Lowe's and finally found the materials at Menards. Now this stuff is not as easy to work with as the rubberized compound, but here's what it looks like. Well, nobody seems to know any of the stuff that I'm looking for. All right, the search for this waterproofing membrane brought me to Menards, and I think I found it. It's called Platon, and it's dimpled, and there it is. There it is. This is the stuff. Almost impossible to find this stuff, but there you go. That is the membrane that we, uh, we use to put over the foundation wall. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> Not as user friendly as the other stuff to work with. It's a, I've used it. It's a good system. Some of them have a filter fabric mat over the dimples. So over the top of these dimples will be a mat that goes over that just to keep this free because this is like a drainage. So you lay this mat up against the foundation wall with the dimples out and those dimples act like a drainage board. A much easier, still effective system is just the rubberized foundation coating and I'm going to explain that right now. Success, we've used the waterproofing compound, then we've used a, a non-permeable plastic over the top of that and insulation over the top of that. And the reason we use polystyrene, that pink insulation, that that's the sheets of it is to protect the waterproofing compound and the plastic membrane that we apply when we use that system we put in drain tile at the bottom of that footing remember we've exposed that footing so we put drain tile in at the bottom of that footing we then put rock in that over the top of that drain tile we then encase that with filter fabric and then we bring in sand or a permeable aggregate, which is important. It depends on how much water you need. I've actually backfilled entire foundation walls with three quarter clear. Another permeable aggregate is class five. I've done entire commercial buildings, hundreds of feet long, eight foot deep with class five because it was specced by an engineering company. And class five is a three quarter inch rock that has all the way down to fines and particulate matter in it and you would think it should not be permeable by any means but it actually is it's just the weirdest thing if I didn't see it and do the job myself I would have never believed it and then we bring that permeable soil up but then at the very top where the clay comes into play that's where we switch to a non permeable soil so remember we're gonna create the same grade in step one we're gonna create that same grade but we're gonna create that same grade with a non-permeable soil, clay. We don't want the water to get through into our system, so we use the clay. So the, as the water hits, it tends to shed, run away, but any water that does soak through then gets picked up by our drain tile system and ran out to wherever we're gonna be outletting. If we can daylight it up, otherwise it would have to get um, brought in. Brought in, or can you even do an external pump? You can. We have, I don't like doing external pumps, especially where we are, simply because they freeze up, they're more maintenance. When you bring the pump inside, then that pump ten, won't tend to freeze up on you and it'll give you better long-term results. Um, but just stubbing in drain tile down at the bottom, water needs a place to go. It's gotta go. It'll find its way right back in your house. Yes, yes, exactly. And so, we've covered the three outside solutions. Grading, number one, which is usually your least expensive and least invasive. Number two is French drain, which is a, a process of grading and then drain tile, surface drain tile. Then number three, which is full-fledged foundation waterproofing, which is 
includes regrading it, includes drain tile, but now instead of a French drain at the top, we put it at the bottom, and then waterproofing the entire wall to make sure no water comes in. And it just depends on how bad or what you can do and what you can't do. And then last is interior drain tile. I'm not a big fan of allowing water in just to pump it back out because you can have just that damp feeling. And I don't like that yeah. damp feeling in the basement. I'm trying to make it dry and comfortable, not moist. Well, they have, well, the, the, with the sump pumps inside, they have the backup battery, the backup system. But yeah. when your power does go out and you're in a heavy rainstorm and you're depending on that sump pump, that's, you know, it can be scary at times. You never know if that's going to fill in your, you're in a basement's going to flood, you're depending on a sump pump. You know water's coming in. Sometimes you have no option. That's the only way your basement's gonna stay dry as a sump pump. It's let's go. In let's situation. go inside and talk about what we do when we're inside a house next. So I don't know what's the cheaper option though. Like I would say between sump pump and outside, that's probably similar. But you're huh? Wouldn't you think digging along the whole foundation? That's expensive. Exactly. Probably close to the same price as an interior. No, sump pump. it's more expensive. Think so? It's more expensive. Okay, I've, I haven't been to the outside. Ones. Oh yeah, no, it's more expensive because there's a lot more work. I mean, you're talking about hauling all that soil out. Yep. And then you're not reusing it, so you're dumping it. Then you're importing in brand new soil. So on a wall like this, you're anywhere from six to ten thousand bucks to do a single wall like this. Now, if it had been done when the house was being built, they could probably waterproof this same wall for six hundred to a thousand dollars. Oh yeah, it's already open. Yeah, it's easy. So it's all that extra work because you're tuck pointing, well, you excavating. Dig, be careful, get it. And in this situation, I would even say more than ten thousand dollars for. That's per side. That's not all four sides right. of the house. Well, you're going to get a small machine in here. It's going to take you longer. It and all depends on. The Situation. And one of the things that some contractors do when they do this foundation waterproofing is they don't compact the soil as they're putting it back in place and then they leave and then six months later or a year later there would be one to two feet of yeah. settlement. And then guess I've what you got? Water, water again. Water coming in. So now yeah. whatever you put in is working a lot harder to keep the water out. So you've got to compact it. Like with the class five that we mentioned earlier, you've got to compact that. Sand, not necessary to compact. You you sh still should hit it, but you don't have to hit it as hard. There's no binding agent in sand, so you're not going to be able to tell that it's getting compacted, but still, you should still hit I'd rather, it. What? I've never not compacted sand either. I always compact when I... You know, te you can. technically, you can compact sand with water. This is one of those weird aggregates where because there's no binding agent in it whatsoever, you can lay it in place and just hosing it down will literally compact it enough because this is where it gets into really you got to really know your soil dynamics but without a binding agent you're not getting that silt in there and then you're literally eliminating the void spaces as the water runs through it it brings this it shrinks the sand down so yeah. sand is super easy to compact that's why i say use sand on this i prefer sand number one number two three quarter clear number three then if it's massive areas like we've done i mean we've done we've done it where i've literally plopped an excavator down into the hole to move all of the aggregate around on giant commercial buildings then you use class five because it's le the least cost prohibitive it does have more labor but that that aggregate gets expensive really fast yep all right let's go inside like i said five minutes ago so when we get into a house before we actually start to do any analysis on what we should be doing outside we always come inside to determine where the water is coming in because water takes the path of least resistance and even though it may look pretty obvious on the outside you may have a leak that is actually the water is coming in from a completely different area and then finding its way in through the yep. foundation wall and so Maybe you have a leak here, but the problem starts on the other side of the room. It's or it's coming up from underneath. Underneath. And then what do you, it doesn't make a difference what you do outside. You have wet soils, maybe there's a spring. Uh, groundwater can move around. Yep. Perched water can event somehow find a way to your house eventually. Mm -hmm. All right, we may be talking a little bit fast for some people, and let's define the difference between perched water and spring water. Perched water is just a pocket of trapped water. Spring water is basically unlimited. 
So one of the things that we do when we first come into a home is we look for the signs of where the water is actually coming in. And so you've got to be a part detective when you do this. And I always start to look at the walls. That's where I usually start. And I start at the bottom of a wall and then I start working my way up. And one of the telltale signs is yellow discoloring in the bottom of the wall. Now these have been painted, so it's almost impossible to find, but I will usually go look right in the corners. So, okay, I can see where, see some right there. Tim, can you point at that? You can see that, I'm guessing. A little bit of yellowing. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and some of this is paint on the floor, but this looks like it's almost a damp. This little spot right here. A damp wall, a little bit of yellowing. So as we come in right here, these, now this has been repainted, but that discoloring right there is one of the signs that we look for. And then I always look to see how far up the wall it goes. Now this, this wall is actually pretty good. Uh, even though it did have a water problem, it's actually in a pretty good state. Um, and this has been covered up with a waterproofing paint. But here, all of these signs, you can see this right here. It's really difficult to see, but this bubbling, this means that there was past water problems here. You can see where there's different layers of paint. That's where the paint's been chipped off. And you can see all through here where there was an issue, but it was corrected at some point. One of the other things that I usually will look at are the window wells as well. So a lot of times I'll see homes that have window wells. Those get filled up if they don't have covers on them and then the water will come through. And sometimes it's as simple as just putting on covers over a window well to correct a potential problem. Oh, one of the things we wanna show you too are for well, window wells. These are the kinds of covers you want. If you get a flat cover, expect the water to sit you want an angled cover you see how these covers have the angle built in automatically that's what you want but now if we've gone through and eliminated all of the obvious choices and we still haven't come up with a solution that's when we go inside of the home and do interior drain tile and let's talk these guys through the process of doing interior drain tile you want to get you want to start that sure um Basically, you have to cut your concrete floor. Well, I'd say usually about 15 inches out or so. Yep. You want to expose the footing. You dig the dirt out, and if you can get it through a window, great. Otherwise, you have to walk each bucket, bucket out. load up and out of the house from the basement stairs. Yep. Then you dig a hole for your sump basket. You have to bring in aggregate, you put, put your drain tile in, you put your aggregate around the drain tile, you put your drain tile, I should say, alongside of the footing. Yeah. So how, that's how we've done it, you put them alongside the footing, you have to get a, I can't think of what the product is, but you put, a, it's got some grooves in it, and it's, a, it's an L that you put along your foundation, and it goes down to the top of your footing, so it allows any water to pass. Behind the, uh, the, the groove channel, you would drill weep holes into your cinder block to allow any water that gets trapped in your cinder blocks, because your cinder blocks are hollow. So you would drill. So what happens is, I don't know if the camera will get down here, but yeah. if, if you'll have, you'll see the top of it, and it'll be, oh, you'll have these little grooves, and it, it sits along the top of your footing, any, and, and then it would cover up the, the weep holes, so you got weep holes behind these groups so the water will sit, go down behind this channel and over your footing and into the drain tile down to the sump pump. And this leads us into a few of the things that you must avoid under any circumstances and that's hard piping an interior drain tile into an outside exterior drain tile. This can cause premature failure due to freezing. You've got to actually allow for an air space to go in there so that you can allow for expansion and contraction. There's a number of different ways of doing that and I'm gonna show you a few of these examples. There's also other options for uh, homeowners that wanna do it themselves. Saw cutting this and bringing in all that aggregate can be a lot of work. There is a prefabricated system that's sold at different home improvement stores. I'm going to go see if I can go find that for you guys and take a quick video of that just to show you what it is. It's gonna give you an idea. It's probably gonna be different than what you can get in your area. It may not be the, it may be the same, it may be different. I don't know, but we'll go show you that. 
All right, there it is. If you guys want to make your life easy, this is the stuff to get. The reason I say that is because it's super light. You can take a whole big section of this and handle it. This is a one and you're done type of a scenario. Let me, let me just explain to you a little bit more what I'm talking about here. All right, you guys, this is a one and you're done. It's a little more expensive, but if you're doing it yourself, this is the kind of stuff for interior drain tile that you're gonna want. Cause look at, this is a 10 foot section. I can pick up, maneuver around. And if I was gonna bring in this, import the same amount of drainage aggregate, here's the thing. This stuff right here, this is like the drainage aggregate. This is the drain tile, but this is the drainage aggregate right here, and it comes all incorporated as one system. This otherwise is rock, and rock that you have to bring in bucket by bucket and haul in. It gets pretty heavy. This is almost like cheating, but it's a lot more expensive. A one section of this is gonna cost you $50. If you wanna know, compare the same thing, a single section of pipe without the wrap is $3. That's how much more expensive it is to get the wrap. If you don't wanna do the work, this is the way to go. What yeah, else do like we need to cover? Yeah, it's a tile with popcorn around yep. it and wrapped in fabric. We've used it. Yep, fast. we've used it on bigger um, projects where it's very difficult to get in and out. So yeah, obviously, after you put your drain tile system in, your sump up, everything gets concrete replaced on top of it. I don't know if I added that to it, but. Okay, um, yeah, and then a uh, battery backup system. One of the things we highly recommend is not just having a sump pump, but having a battery backup on that sump pump as well, because the times when your sump pump goes out is when your power goes out and right. it's in the middle of a storm and that's yep. when your basements are gonna flood. Yep, you have inches of rain dropping on you and no power, it would be a bad situation. Yeah. If you're totally reliant on the sump pump only. So, you've got, we've covered pretty much the four main components, four main things that you can do to fix a wet basement. I hope this video has helped you guys out. Is there anything we've left out, Tim? Uh, I can't think of anything right now. All right, that's all we've got. Let me know what you think of this in the comments down below. God bless you guys. Go get them, and I hope your basement stays dry.